Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our BFO Up Young Producer webinar series. Um, so we're about to begin here this evening, um, and thank you all for taking the time to join us. We appreciate that on uh, taking some time out of your evening to, to join in tonight. So we have uh, Jen and Scott Legg that are here to, to talk with us. So we're going to go through a few things first, just in regards to Beef Farmers of Ontario. Um, so I just wanted to go over about our Young Producer webinar series. We try to do these once um, every month, roughly. So this is the third one that we've done um, within this uh, series so far. Just make sure you guys can see my screen here. Um, so this will be our, our third one that we've done. So the first one um, that we did was with Adam and Marie Shea. And the last one that we did was Doug and Bonnie um, Gray from Piper Creek Farms. And uh, they were able to give us an overview of their operation as well. Um, so we're looking forward to, uh, to more of that tonight too with, uh, with Jen and Scott. So any of the previous webinars that we've done are also posted online. So anybody can go back and watch those. So any of the previous ones that we've done uh, last year as well um, can all be found on our website. So we'd encourage you guys to, to share those with anybody else who is interested and encourage people to take time to do those as well. Um, another event too, or another, um, sorry, there we go. Uh, Cattlemen's Young Leaders Program. So this is a program that probably many of you have heard of um, that's run through the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. And um, this program is available to people uh, aged 18 to 35. And myself and also Beth Story within uh, BFO have had the opportunity to take part in this mentorship program. Um, but basically it's a program that pairs you up with an individual mentor um, that's available in something that you have an area of interest in. So when I did mine, uh, my focus was really on feedlot health and nutrition. Um, and you're able to be paired up with a mentor for a year long mentorship program. So applications are open for that program now. Um, if you have any questions about it at all, I'd encourage you to either ask myself or Beth's story. Um, Jason Hurst has also completed. There's a few of us across Ontario that have done it, uh, but this is a national program. So if you have any questions about that, I would encourage you guys uh, to reach out and ask about that as well. And uh, as many of you have heard, with, uh, if you're in at your county meetings recently, we're again offering the Young Producer Development Program at our AGM. Um, so our AGM is in February uh, 19th and 20th in Toronto. So the Young Producer Program is an opportunity to get um, a group of producers together, give them an opportunity to network, um, and it's open to producers who are not um, coming as a voting delegate on behalf of their county. So they are open to apply for the program. It is fully funded by Farm Credit Canada. And we're doing a uh, networking session before uh, the banquet. And we're also gonna do an opportunity for everyone to kind of network and meet for those who are attending the Cattlemen's College on the, on the evening before. So applications for that are still open. So from age 19 to 40. So we'd encourage you as well, if you're not coming um, to our AGM as a voting delegate for your county, uh, we'd encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity as well. And application forms are also found on our website for that. Um, again, encouraging everyone to get connected with social media um, as other information that we have on our BFO website, as well as a weekly newsletter that gets sent out. Um, and social media really is a great way to hear about different events that we have that are coming up as well. So we'd encourage you to, to take a look at some of that stuff. Um, and that is pretty much all that we have for the BFO uh, update part. So without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Scott and Jen Legg from Legg Beef Farms. They uh, have a feedlot in Burst County. Um, so we'll turn it over to them so they can do uh, a presentation. I should note as well for questions, unfortunately, there isn't an opportunity to ask questions directly. So there is a box where you can type questions in. So I encourage you to take the time throughout their presentation. Feel free to type any questions in that you have. And then um, we'll try to get to those at the end for Scott and Jen to go through and answer. So I will turn things over now to them. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Good. 
Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is my my very first uh, webinar. I've so hopefully uh, I can organize everything, mm -hmm. run all the buttons, and do it properly. Um, Jen has lots of experience with with webinars, so she'll nope, I have lots of experience watching, watching webinars, webinars with sorry, yeah. my screen <laughs> um, closed and it on mute. So no. <laughs> So we'll just get started uh, right away here with uh, some slides. Um, so I click there, okay. There Hopefully that's uh, working for everybody. Leg B Farm, Scott and Jen. Um, trying to move to the next, there we go. Okay, so uh, just a couple of pictures here kind of introducing us, that's our, our farm sign. So there's my father, Murray, myself, and my son, Colton, in that picture. Uh, and then the, the bottom picture, that's the, the whole crew. Uh, Jen, myself, Colton, our daughter, Taylor, my mother, Anne, and my father, Murray. Uh, so we've been... Uh, okay, cool. Sure. So we, uh, yeah, both of us graduates of... Uh, University of Guelph, um, the diploma program. I took uh, the farm operator and manager program in for both 97 A's. Mm -hmm. And I and I did horticulture, um, which was kind of a, a little bit of a weird thing back then. I was really looking to be um, do landscape design, um, golf course management, but I have the diploma in agriculture and we took the same courses. So <laughs> not quite the same anymore, but it was a, a real eye opener of an opportunity. I, um, I did not grow up on a farm, which I usually like to uh, let people know about. I grew up in town, in the big town of Port Elgin, and um, started out uh, at Western doing botany, and then decided to move to Guelph um, for horticulture, and got a lot of ribbing from people that said that I was gonna marry a farmer, and I said, that's okay, I'll marry a farmer, but we're gonna live in town, and he can drive to work, um, but it didn't work out that way somehow. <laughs> So I didn't come to um, I didn't come to farming um, organically. I married into it. So um, it, the whole thing has been a learning experience for me and, and interesting at that. So a little bit of farm background. Uh, we have a, a feed, a lot of finishing feed, a lot of Chesley. So Chesley, if you don't know, is right kind of smack dab in the middle of Bruce County. Um, we're the fifth generation on this farm, actually even in this house. Uh, so it's been, we've been at this location for well, almost forever. Uh, so I, <laughs> seems like forever. For a little over, for about 125 yeah. years, not quite forever. <laughs> I don't think there was any electricity or, it basically seems like to be a time 125 years ago. Yeah, a log house was here first and then the, the yellow brick house were in now. So I farm with, uh, with my parents, Murray and Ann, and we have one full-time uh, hired man, Derek. And we we finish around a thousand head a year, sometimes some a few years is a little bit more, a thousand to eleven hundred head anyways. Uh, and we have a thousand acres of, of crop, uh, corn, soybeans, wheat, and hay. Everything soybeans are sold and the wheat is sold. Uh, we need the straw for bedding. We have all uh, like a manure pack barns, uh, no slats. Uh, all the corn we grow is fed to the cattle, and all the hay we we, uh, we grow is fed to the cattle also. Uh, and we're proud supporters of the Ontario Corn Fed Beef Program. My father Murray was actually one of the 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 founding fathers of the program, helped develop that, and he's been on the actually been on the board of directors since the the cattle feeders uh, since their inception. So a couple shots of our our farm. Uh, see both both houses in the same property, so we were in the original farmhouse, and and my parents built a new house in it'll be a little over 40 years ago. So uh, we have cattle here, and we also got another uh, another property just up the road, uh, the original farm that Jen and I bought. We lived there when we first got married. There's uh, a converted dairy barn that we uh, when we bought it, we we gutted it and. and turned into a beef barn and an old bank barn uh, with an outside yard that we really only use in the in the kind of in the fall and early in the spring. It's kind of the overflow yard. If we don't have room, we'll just kind of assemble cattle there till we till we get some some cover for them. 
a lot nicer to keep everything under the roof. Don't have to deal with the with the rain and and all kinds of weather and that kind of stuff. So uh, that's the only one that's that's really exposed to the elements. Uh, so the bottom picture, you can kind of see the the barns. Uh, the the biggest barn there we built five six maybe six years ago this spring, and uh, it's uh, yeah like I said a pack barn uh, holds 360 head. Uh, all the pens that we have are kind of designed uh, for to hold multiples of 40. So that when we sell them, there's uh, like it fits nicely in the in the full load. So 40 40 per load. So it'll be 120 uh, or 160 or 200, whatever. However that works for. It never really seems to work out because you can't seem to get the the right number on the loads when they're coming down, uh, coming in as calves. So we kind of we may have to throw a few couple extra on or a couple less on a few loads to get those but we generally try to assemble them in groups of 40. So cattle uh, mostly secure uh, sourced from Alberta. Um, we bought some Ontario calves we hadn't for for a long long time just and no real particular reason just uh, like mostly genetics and the and the health they seem to be a lot harder from Alberta. So we, we did buy some uh, in the fall of 2018 and we were really happy with them. So we bought uh, quite a few more this fall. Uh, but the cost to bring them from Alberta is getting uh, really, it's high, it's, it's very expensive. It's over, it's, uh, well, it's about 100, and, it's over $100 a head now to bring them down. And it's becoming harder and harder to get uh, trucks to do that. There's a, they don't, it's not a really, there's not drivers to do it, and uh, with new with regulations, it's just becoming it's becoming very difficult, and, and a lot of companies just just don't want to don't want to do it. So um, I don't. There wasn't as many cattle came down in general uh, from from Alberta, Ontario this year, so trucks weren't really as big an issue as, as some years. But we have a good uh, kind of set things up ahead of time uh, with the with the company that we use. So he's has this. Kind of speak to the trucks ahead of time we know what sales we're going to be buying at and, and you can have a truck out there out there and bring them home generally calves uh six to 650 pounds we're not really we're not super picky on the on the weight that's mostly where they end up being i prefer a heavier calf just because you can get them uh get them on the market quicker uh, but generally most will fit in that six to 650 pounds when they come uh, we aim for a, a finish weight of 15 to 1600 pounds uh, the last little bit here in the fall, they've got quite a bit bigger. The last couple loads are up in the high 17s. That's pretty standard across the whole province with the with the backlog. Uh, we weren't we were pretty good at uh, uh, getting them out. Uh, we weren't too far back, but it just they seem to kind of just one week adds on, and you get a little bit behind, and that's they just end up getting bigger. We aim for the the that 15 to 1600 pounds. Uh, because when they kill those cattle and all the steaks to be a, a good steak, you really want them like a nice inch to an inch and a quarter. And when you get to those really, really big cattle, uh, if they cut them that over an inch thick, then then the steaks become quite large, like 16 ounce, 17 ounces. So yeah. which, which we've had. We, we had there. Yeah, we don't. We don't, don't mind. They don't like it on the market though. It's just in the, the gross. Restaurant doesn't want it. Yeah, it, yeah. it really just becomes too uh, too expensive in the store. You know, when you look at it, and you know, it's if the steak is is uh, 12 pounds, it just they look at that. It's one steak, and it becomes too much dollars, and that shies them away from them. For some reason, they don't want to cut them in half and, and share them. Everybody has their own steak, but so anyways, the 15 to 1600 pound that range gets a nice, you know, that between 10 and 12 ounce uh, strip line. So that, that works really good. It works and that's a big enough animal for us to have that, uh, to, to have enough margin from what we've paid over, over them. If you're, when you're selling, I feel when you're selling cattle and that, you know, that 13 to 1400 pounds, they just don't bring enough dollars to really, uh, to make that spread. Uh, we usually put 160 to 200 head out on pasture ourselves, and then and then bring them in and finish them. Uh, gets us on a, a different market. Uh, that's that spring market. There's not uh, market isn't flooded at that time of year, so there's it's usually a good a good price for us. Uh, the goal 
three and a half to four pounds average daily gain. Um, sometimes we can get them higher. We've had uh, we've had lots do over four, which is nice. Sometimes they get down like with those those cattle this fall there that have been held back. Uh, you know their their gains go down after a while because they just they can't really grow anymore and and uh, there's really nothing you can do about it. But uh, and then uh, feed conversion we're generally between six and six and a half pounds to of feed on dry matter basis to a pound of gain. So really good performance. Uh, I feel that's I'm I'm happy with that kind of performance. The genetics that we use here. Uh, mostly straight limousine uh, and we don't shy away there's lots some guys use limousine cross and that's that's fine usually a Charlotte or Angus um, really we're a few Belgian blue cross one herd that we buy from Alberta he has a uh, uh, we usually get about 100 calves out of his out of, from him and he's got some Belgian blue Belgian blue Angus cows bred back to a limousine bull which and they're real nice they're like nice fancy animals they kind of get the best of all three worlds really on that uh, and, and really interesting to look at some of them too so we look for those high yielding fancy type of cattle uh and and lots of length that's one thing that i can't uh, really stress enough like length is is really actually important for adding value to the animals um, it adds a lot of weight and a lot of, you know, high, the meat in that in that length of that loin area. You can add a few extra inches to the animal. Um, just, I think that's when that comes from. You get that with the limo of Angus. You know, they tend to be a little kind of shorter uh, lengthwise, so that's why we go with the with the limousine. It adds a nice, nice fancy animal with lots of length. And we generally uh, work on a 63% dress yield. So when we when we sell them, we sell them here live uh, and weigh them, and then it's all converted back to a 63 dress yield when we when we uh, with the dress price. So here's a picture. This is just inside the new barn. You can see there's some on the. Hopefully it's not. We just realized tonight when you're doing webinar stuff that the camera's flipped. Hopefully this is the same way. <laughs> on the left side. Uh, there's some some finished animals. Those animals actually just uh, left today, and then the rest of the barn is some calves. They're 750, 750 pounds now. So with this barn, uh, there's there's gates dividing it, and it divides it into three. The front and the back uh, make a pen, and when so when we get down on animals, so there's only 40 left in the with the big cattle. So we were able to lock them ahead. And we had the the calves on the right hand side. There was a quite a few extra in that pen, so we got lots of flexibility. That barn you can kind of open some gates up and give a little bit extra room if you have it. Uh, if you've got a few, few more than the 120 that we're aiming for. So, uh, like I said, that barn was built in it'll be six years. So nice high roof, lots of air in it, lots nice and bright. Uh, really, really happy with the performance of that barn. Uh, shot of some limos. This is kind of what we're looking for. Nice, uh, nice big back ends on them. Um, lots of length. Maybe can't you can't see the length in, in those ones, but that's you can tell those are those are fancy shears. Those are they're well over 1,700 pounds. So that's kind of that comes from a herd that we bought for years. And they're uh, that's kind of the I those are the, the standard that I judge. All the other ones against, really, in my mind, they they're they're just almost perfect animals. Lots of growth, lots of potential, amazing performance. So that's kind of what I'm what we're looking for here. Uh, technology on on our farm. Uh, so now we have been for two years using uh, performance beef. It's a uh, it's on your iPad. Uh, it's a subscription based. Uh, you do all your batch sheets, it tracks all your feed intakes, everything, it tracks everything as you load it and then everything as you deliver that feed. So it gives us accurate performance and, and financial records. You can put all your, your costs of your cattle, all the medicine, every, anything that you do, you can add to it and it tracks everything you do and, and give you a nice close with 
all the information you could you could ever ask for. So that that helps with our decision making, you know, to really get us a, a really accurate cost of gain and, and and performance numbers on on groups of animals, so we can decide, you know, this this group maybe isn't uh, they're not doing what we want them to do. It's really hard. Some you look at cattle and they sometimes they they look they look great and but at the end of the day if they're not performing then we just don't we won't we don't want to buy them again we're not they just won't fit into our there's no use feeding them for nothing <laughs> and then all our processing shoots we have scales attached to them and then the gallagher system so as we're every time we're running those animals through uh the rfid tags are red and all the uh the health information and and medication whatever we're doing to them it's recorded so it's all, all tracked. All our cattle are sold uh, to Norwich Packers. Uh, they've been, we've, we've actually, we used to take them all to, uh, to an auction and then, oh, maybe it's gotta be almost 15 years now. Uh, I, yeah, I think it was, it would have been around 2006. Maybe even before that, but just really, they were buying a lot of the cattle at, at market at the auction, and the the cost, you know, I, I, if I recall, it was at a time where things were pretty low, uh, and we're really I was looking at kind of ways to save money, and you know, fifteen to twenty dollars a head uh, to to sell them to the auction, thousand head a year, so there's $20,000 that we save ourselves when, when they're buying them anyway. So that's, uh, that's why we kind of just started going, going direct to them. So everything is sold here on a live weight basis. Uh, so weight here and some shrimp taken off and then the dress price uh, that, that we negotiate, uh, then we convert that back to a live price based on a 63% yield. So the nice thing about, uh, all the cattle going to the same place all the time. You know, if, if there is, if a load goes and, and it does happen lots of times, you know, uh, usually the, the first ones out of the pen, they're not what we call hard. Uh, so there'll be more, they won't yield quite as much. And, and you know, if there's an issue, then we can, we can make an adjustment on the next load uh, to make it, make it fair for everybody. So, and that's the, like I said, the nice thing about going to the same place all the time that, you know, that nobody ever ends up feeling like they, they got the, the, the dirty end of the stick. So uh, we do 30 to 40 percent forward contracting. Uh, that really only started, I guess, about three, yeah, three or four years ago. We were always just cash, and that that worked fine. We it, to change over to contract, it was a kind of a a hard thing to get my mind around because the we were always used to getting the highest price. Like whatever, whenever we sell the cattle, but that's it, that's the highest price. And but the highest price that day is not necessarily the highest price that those cattle were ever going to be. So it, it took me a little bit to kind of get my head head around that. That you know, selling them at different times that that I'll get I can get more money by doing that as opposed to to what the, the highest price is of the day that they're going. Um, so it's it's worked out well. Uh, you know, there's times of years where uh, that you're you know the market is going to be depressed and and if you can you kind of have an idea where you think that market's that depressed market's going to be if six months ahead of time you think okay here's you know what I can it's there's a bad market but right now I can lock a profit in during when I know it's going to be a bad market then that's just good business to take to do it that way so. Uh, we're, like I said, we're on the Ontario Corn Fed Beef Program, a uh, wonderful program, uh, and, and Norwich has been in, in that right from the start too, so uh, we can talk about that a little bit later from Lake. And we are in the RMP Program, another, that's an awesome program, except that the government needs to, to fully fund it. That's the really only downfall of that program, um, you know, to, to have your risk covered like that. Uh, I it's real. It's. I think the the industry in Ontario would be a lot. We. I don't know whether it would have made it this far uh, without that RMP program because we've we've come through some pretty pretty bad years the last 
last three or four here, and, and that's really kind of saved our bacon. So just for some, uh, I guess, comparison, uh, in my mind, how we work here, yield equals dollars. So I just threw some numbers together here, kind of comparing. Uh, so like I said, you know, we're working a 63% yield. So if you take a 1,550 pound animal, which is kind of, you know, right down the middle we're aiming for, uh, you get your 976 pound carcass, 250, you've got $2,440. Uh, you go to a, I would say the, the average in Ontario is probably around that 61%, you know, if you take into all breeds. So you've, you've got a little smaller carcass, so we're about, uh, about $80 less per head, um, kind of a, a, you know, just using a, an average animal. And then uh, you go to a, a 59 yield, uh, which would be more, you're kind of a, your Angus type animal. And I hope I don't offend anybody with, with when I talk about different breeds, I have nothing against any other breed. We, we have a kind of specific animal uh, you know, makeup of that animal that we're looking for. And, and I, I just want to stress that I'm not trying to get down on anything. We're just comparing numbers. Every breed has their, has their strengths and weaknesses. So um, if, uh, if I'm, if I sound like I'm getting down on your favorite breed, I apologize. But so if you, you go to a 59% yield uh, and that, that, I think a lot of these Angus these days, if it's a pure black Angus, uh, you'll be down even even less than that. So I mean, basically, you know, it's eighty eighty dollars every time you drop two percent. So you know, you go from just kind of a a low yielding one to to a high yielding one. You know, we're looking at one hundred and sixty dollars per head uh, just on just on on the on the carcass itself without without taking any efficiencies from from breeds and animals like on on yield or not on yield sorry on on uh, average daily gain and, and anything like that so uh here's another another animal so you can see in this one what i'm talking about when i look for length uh like they're just they're long they're powerful animals lots of muscle um pretty clean too uh we're even though we're a bedded bar a bedded pack we clean and bed everything. I would like it to be every week, but it never seems to last that long. I would say probably six days is would be an average uh, uh, clean out cycle. So uh, I mean, just clean everything out, start fresh, and just kind of keeps the animals nice and clean. The air is always fresh in the barn. As soon as it starts getting wet and dirty in there, we'll clean it out. And uh, one more picture. This is our son Colton. So. Uh, I didn't mention we feed twice a day, uh, so to kind of smaller batches and, and really uh, kind of even fine tune their intakes that way. Um, you know, we'll load up the feed and I'll check the bunks in the morning and then with the performance beef, I can just go on my phone as I'm walking around and, and change the, the amounts that are supposed to be fed in each pen. And uh, then same thing again, I know that it's, um, I don't have to change it very often. Uh, we're pretty dialed in on where they're supposed to be, but you know, if if I happen to notice in the daytime that that uh, you know it's two hours to to the to the night chores to the afternoon chores and this bunk's empty, then I can just like I said, whip my phone out, add a couple hundred pounds to that batch, it changes everything and and, uh, and sets that delivery up. So uh, really getting the exact amount that those cattle need, uh, really. Uh, really fine tuning and really really stable for for their intakes which i think is a, a big a big part of performance so and then as we're feeding twice a day then i'm we're, we're walking around checking pens twice a day making sure everybody's happy and healthy so you know limousine they get a kind of a bad rap for for their uh, their demeanor and it's true sometimes when they come they're like this particular animal here he's in a group that is actually uh, kind of known in Alberta for their their uh, I don't want to say poor temperament. They're they're known to be wild animals, but <laughs> but after you spend time with them, walk through them twice a day, just calm them down, and this is what you end up with an animal that they just they're they're almost like pets. They 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 come walking up to you, you give them a scratch. They they really don't 
they have no they're not afraid of you they you, they almost don't even know that you're there unless they unless they want to scratch so we uh we did a there was an article in a, the new holland news and he uh a gentleman came and took photos and that's this is what he uh this actually made the cover of the magazine so we're really proud of of that that you know you can get your animals quieted down like that uh you know there's a, a guy he emailed me after this he, he ran a pork processing plant in manitoba and he emailed me right after this came out and he said this is he says i took that picture and i framed it and i put it up on my office wall he says that is one of the, the greatest pictures that i have ever seen <laughs> so we're, we're pretty proud of that so that's the end of that there okay so uh that's kind of what i had for for presentation um i don't know if there's any questions so far um i haven't seen anything anything popped up um so we'll just talk we asked if, uh we could talk a little about the corn fed beef program um like i said we've been on it for basically from the start uh, it's a really it's an awesome program uh hopefully you've seen you've been to cattle feeders convention or or anywhere they talk about the 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 economic value of what this this program has bought brought to the ontario industry uh you know it's, it's become a world renowned and uh the record keeping part um most most of the well, all the stuff that you, you do in the program, you're probably doing that regardless on your farm. Uh, you know, and, and they give you everything you need to the papers. You can to mark down all your treatment records and everything. So, like I said, we're using the Gallagher system, so a lot of that stuff is is already automatic. Uh, we've got a, like a digital copy of of all our all our stuff that we we do to it, and then anything that isn't on that uh, is written down on a on one of their farms. So. Uh, we anything we when we do treat an animal uh like i said we write it down we also throw another tag in this year with the date and the uh and the medicine that we gave gave to that animal so that uh we know that's just another kind of fail safe in there that uh and also with i check the pens dad check the pens so if i if we have one with a sore foot and we've treated him he's got a tag in his ear and then if dad goes and checks the next day instead of him saying oh well there's a steer with a sore leg there or sore foot he needs to be treated or or treating it again because he doesn't know that it's done then it, you can just look at it and say oh okay i can see that that that, that animal was done yesterday so it's kind of a one extra layer of safety i guess so we're not over medicating anything um you don't have much to add to that? I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a, a question that has come in here now, too. So I can sure. ask you a few of those. And I would encourage anybody else to feel free to type in some questions if you have them. Uh, but the question was just around what sort of vaccination, uh, weaning, castration, or herd health protocols are you looking for when you're purchasing your calves? And any kind of preference in particular when you're sourcing your calves? uh yeah well dehorn for sure uh like if we're there there is some cattle here that show up uh with horns and that has to be dealt with and that's a that's a real uh kind of a, a pain in the butt to do especially when they start when they're when they get to that to the weight that we're doing so i mean the sooner you can do that um yeah vaccinations ibr the whole protocol uh the ones the one group that uh, that we do buy, he he vaccinates his his cows. He vaccinates the calves again, and then he vaccinates boosters them again a couple weeks before um, before they they go to market before he sells them. And we have virtually no problem with those animals. Like no, rarely any retreats. Uh, so I mean money on vax spent on vaccination is the best is the best that you can do when they come in here we're so we'll booster them again ibr uh covaxin uh we give them uh we'll give them ivmec on arrival and 
and uh, and an implant, a lot like a low dose, uh, just a straight estradiol implant. So we don't want don't they don't need implants until they get here. Uh, calves are going to grow regardless whether they have an implant or not. Like from that from birth to that you know that 600 pound where wherever you sell them, and there can be some issues with them if if you do if you do implant them, and that way they're all kind of synced here when 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 they get here so if we give them the first implant there's nothing in them we know that's the first one and everybody's on the same schedule and we don't need animals here that are showing up with a you know half half an implant and then we give them another one and it's it's too much uh too much hormone and they start to kind of act up and and ride or whatever so uh, and then we will we'll revaccinate everything uh once we after in the fall uh we sort everything after a couple months and sort them. So when a load of calves come, uh, you know, if they're 600 pound average, there's anywhere from, you know, there could be four fifties in there. There could be a couple of 700 pounds in there. And those don't fit in the same, uh, the same pen. They don't need to go and feed at the same time. So we'll sort all the animals around uh, once they're all going and put them in, in, in groups of 120 of same size animal. And that way when they're, they're we can get the right, the right ration to those cattle at the right time and really like fine tune how we're feeding them because you don't need to have 900 pounders in there and they need you know a certain ration but then you've got some some 700 pounders in there that need to be back back down a little bit longer so and then we'll re-implant them again revaccinate um and then uh come back in with some with uh, a different uh dewormer and a different uh lowest control so for for what we're looking for in calves, uh, yeah, definitely dehorned, uh, castrated. Make sure that you have two in there when you're doing it. Uh, you get the odd one here where where they've they've been, you know, put a put an elastic on them, and and Dad always jokes, you know, they 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 forgot to count to two because there's a there's one still in there, and that's that's a real a real nuisance to have uh, to have those belly stones because you can't do anything about it really. Uh, we just leave them you know there's they're kind of staggy and and uh they cause some problems in the feed yard but if you can make sure you get got both of them in there that's you know hand cut that always says hand cuts the best uh, because then you you know for sure once you pull two out of there um so yeah castrated uh ibr uh like a vaccine is what we give them i, I don't know what the cow calf uh, equivalent is is of that uh it's like an 11 or 12 way vaccine and uh no, knowing what silage is and and uh in a, in a bunk you know you don't have to mostly a bunk that's the, that's the thing you know they come especially from the west it's it's a long a long trip down and it, it is they're tired when they get here but if they they know what the bunk is we feed them and they're not afraid to stick their head through that bunk and, and you know get filled right back up and get back on feed right away so because some cattle they don't they're kind of hanging around they're looking wondering you know where's uh where's my hay feeder you know i don't i don't eat at that kind of thing so if they if they're introduced to that that's a that's a big a big bonus uh you had mentioned about uh changes in transportation regs and that may be affecting uh and cost even of transportation and maybe limiting the amount of calves you bring from the west um, so in Ontario or any local calves in particular, are you looking for more um, direct owner lots that you could purchase or would you be more open to purchasing from a calf club that has set protocols and uniform weight of calves? Uh, yeah, everything, the, the groups that we bought, they were, they were bought out of the a, a calf club, uh, sale in Katie and, you know, those, those sales in Katie from, from a cow calf producer standpoint, they're they're great. Like those are the, the those are the highest sale prices in in North America at those sales. So if you can if you can jump on one of those and and do that, I'm you know if if you do everything that they're doing, I'm we're happy to buy them direct too. Um, as long as you're doing everything, like that's kind of how we I guess eliminate groups that we don't buy. You know we bought we bought cattle uh, and. You know you have problems with them and sometimes you can't help it you know it's conditions uh you know at sale time whatever weather or whatnot but there's one group in in particular a couple of years ago when 
you know, there was, I think it was a group of about 35 and we bring them home and they, they all got sick and mycoplasma. I think we lost the first year we lost seven out of 35 and there was nothing, nothing we could do about it. And, you know, what do you, what do you do? And then the same cattle next year, like, well, you don't, you just think it's just kind of bad luck. And we, we bought the same, at the same herd the next year and we lost three or four again and and you know a lot of mycoplasma and a lot of just just terrible health issues so then you know that's it we do you know when we once shame on shame on me fool me twice or however that goes but you know we just said we, we will never buy those again so i mean if you we're happy to buy them direct but make sure you're doing everything and and because it, it, it shows up if you're not if you're if you're kind of saying that you're doing the stuff but but trying to save yourself you know two or three dollars by not giving that that uh that that vaccination uh, that's going to cost you in the long run because in this business reputation is is everything so you want to make sure that you have a you know a, a diamond grade reputation those are good comments for sure um just going back to when you had talked about a lot about um, yield on cattle and getting paid on a live weight basis. Do you also, do you have anything set up to get premiums back for um, how cattle grade? And do you get individual performance back on animals? So things even like um, back on liver abscesses or tag on cattle, marbling, that kind of thing? Uh, we we haven't been getting any information back. Um, Kind of one thing that really I think what well, we, sh we probably should be, you know, we really haven't had any any complaints, I guess, from from Norwich on 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 any issue really, uh, and unless they don't make that yield, you know, like I said, we try. I feel ours are the some of the cleanest cattle you'll see, so there's never an issue that there, um, you know, being the, I think feeding the twice a day and and made, keeping everything uh, very stable would be a lower lower incidence of acidosis so you know a lot easier on their livers I, I think we're doing probably everything we can to to minimize any any issues that'll show up you know at the packing plant so and, and if there ever is issue they they always let us know and and but but thus far you know really really no complaints from them whatsoever um premium wise we do we do get a little premium um uh, so when we, when we price them, it's it's based on on the price that day, and then a little bit over top of that. And part of that, uh, you know, with a high yielding animal, they it it helps them too. Like their the fixed cost of the plant are are the same whether you're killing you know a 57 or 59 percent yield or a or a 63 percent yield. So at the end of the day, if they kill a load of our steers. Uh, they've got all the same labor costs, same operating costs, but at the end of the day, you know, they've, they've got, like I said, 80, 80 or hundred pounds more of, uh, of saleable meat per animal to sell from that, from that day's, that day's work. So, and then with the limousine too, the, with the higher yielding, you know, it's not just the carcass, there's a, the cutout value of that animal, uh, like less bone, um, and you know, the longer animal, there's more. Like you, you, I always like to think about the the you know you add two inches onto the length of the steer, which isn't which is really, you wouldn't even notice it, but you know two inches in the center there where those real high value, you know you get four more strip lines and and you know two more real thick uh, um, fillets out of that. You know there's that can that's like sixty or eighty dollars on top of that just in those two inches of of extra meat of high value cuts. So uh like the length animal really makes a difference so with those animals you know we're hopefully you know helping them we get a little bit more and and out of that they're also getting a little bit more so no real no uh i guess there's no grid or anything that we get paid on and part of the yield uh or not the yield the the selling them live too um we don't there's no discounts for uh for overweights or anything like that and so which you know in a year like this where a lot of people are getting getting dinged for that it's it's kind of nice to not have to have to worry about those because i know on on some people's checks that's a 
a very large, large discount. Um, but it also gives Norwich, they get some flexibility too. Uh, they've got a, a barn just outside of, of town that they rent and some pens there too. So they can, you know, we can sell them a load of cattle and if they have other customers too, and maybe, the, you know, they come in, they've got 25 heads, so, but they need 45 or whatever to kill for the day. So they'll kill that guy's 25 and they can bring 20 of ours in. So they, they don't, as our cattle go down to Norwich, they don't just show up there and they kill them all the next day. Like they might kill, they might kill five tomorrow and they might kill 30 the next day and leave some more. They can kind of fill them in to their, their kill schedule too. So um, it, it works, it works good for them. Um, from that aspect too. Has it been hard to build a relationship with that, um, with a packer that allows that kind of flexibility and, and how long, I guess, does it take to earn that kind of trust with them too and the quality of product you guys are delivering? Uh, I don't, well, like I said, they were buying a lot of animals. I mean, I guess they knew what they were getting into for kind of from the start of the relationship. They, we, you know, we have always had you know, kind of lean towards those, the type of animals that we're feeding. Um, so they, they knew what they're getting into. They had kind of had an idea uh, from the start. So, I mean, even, yeah, they, uh, you know, we've been with them for, I guess, probably, yeah, 15, at least 15 years. And, you know, so they, and like I said before, you know, if there is something, you know, with a, a group of cattle, they don't, uh, they don't yield for some reason, then, we can make that adjustment. So it's a two-way street. Everybody, everybody, usually ends up on the winning side because we're getting a premium, they're getting some extra, and and nobody's really ever trying to, you know, take advantage of each other. So it's 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 good to have a relationship like that because you know when things when things do get get tough and like this fall when we backed up and you know people I know there's lots of people in Ontario that that couldn't bring calves in because they were you know filled with fat cattle and you know i can call down to them and say you know what we need this pen uh we've got a load of cattle that are going to be here next tuesday so i've got two loads in there you know so we need to have those out and they make arrangements to to get those out and, and find a place for them because they don't if i don't have the cattle here they're not going to be able to buy the back and and, it's, and the same thing happens the other way around you know the, the load of cattle that went today uh, it was supposed to go last uh, last Friday, and he, he called me on Thursday, and he said I've got you know too many other groups of, of small animals, and I don't have a pen for them for the weekend. Can we can we leave until Monday? And I said sure, no problem. You know whatever it doesn't you know they're they're big cattle. They're at the end of the feeding period. There's there was no I'm not getting anything that you know I probably they probably at to the point where they're they're losing money to feed them any further, but but that helps him out. And as long as you're, everybody's working together, you know, you have to have a relationship and I can't really, I can't stress the importance of relationships in this business in the, in the beef industry, because if you, if you think you're going to go it alone and, and try and take advantage of people, you know, it's hard enough when, when you're getting along with everybody to try and try and do this when people are fighting you. I think those are definitely very good comments and very good advice to, to be giving, especially for new entrants that are getting involved too. Um, in terms of, of getting involved, I guess as well, um, so both you, Scott and Jen, are both involved um, with your county uh, association and Murray is also involved with cattle feeders. Um, what do you feel the importance of that is of getting involved or, or why did you decide to both originally get involved? Yes, sir. Why did I get involved? Um, for me, I guess, um, Scott had been on the board of directors for the Bean Farmers for a lot of years. And so I'd been attending their barbecue and helping out with the barbecue and the Christmas party when we used to do things like that. Um, but I guess probably the year that I became the first lady of the Bruce County Bean Farmers <laughs> was the year before I became the secretary treasurer. So I just, I thought it was, it's a really interesting group of guys to just get to hang out and talk with. Not just guys, sir. We have several women on our on our committee now, but at the time it was guys, guys and me. Um, and neat group to be with, neat group to just hear the chatter and the comments about the um, about the industry, um, and uplifting too. 
most meetings, the guys aren't down on the industry. There's a little bit of it, but there's a, a lot of good conversation happening there too. So it was a way for me to um, gain a better understanding of just the general conversation of what was happening day to day, not just what I was hearing from my own firm, but what was happening around as well. Um, I also have been really busy, um, kind of attached to my kids. So minor hockey, the school, different things like that. And the Bruce County Bee Farmers are big supporters of um, really any organization in Bruce County that's looking to serve beef at their event. So at a hockey banquet, at um, a tournament, a fundraising tournament. So that was a real opportunity for me to connect with Bruce County Bee Farmers and other organizations that I'm involved with and help promote beef in the county. So it was a, it, it's been a good, a good fit, I think, for, for me to be able to do those things and to be able to um, promote eating beef, which maybe I'm a little bit more of an expert on than growing beef. <laughs> but that, that, that's what got me involved in the first place. Yeah, so I, I've been, I, like Jen said, I was the president of our county organization uh, be six years ago now. And I didn't join up uh, to to the county organization. I was kind of a latecomer. Like I attended our barbecue every you know in the summer and stuff, but I wasn't really part of it till till I'd been kind of in the business for maybe you know ten years or so. And uh, kind of about this when I started joining, in, there was a few young guys, and and uh, and then we've got a lot of like, we've got a good cross section of, of of age, which I think is really important to have those older guys who have been through that and you know sometimes we need a reminder about you know how how things can go or or just just the experience in general and then lots of say, maybe more experienced guys yeah not experience. older guys <laughs> and then lots of younger guys who you know who, who have great ideas that you know that you know fresh fresh ideas on on perspective and and i think joining an organization like that is really good because i'm a, a feed out operator and you know i know most of the people that I know are kind of in the feedlot thing and and to get to join an organization like that and then you get to know you know more cow calf guys that you didn't you know your county is a big area man like you can like Roos County from from top to bottom it'd, it'd take you well, three hours to drive it so you would never know know those people or know what's going on there and, and it kind of brings everybody together uh, and what they're doing in different areas of the county and, and learning about what's going on in that uh, in that that part of the industry you know you, you sit down you have a meeting and you ask and talk about you know all their calving problems or or coyote problems or what the the background are guys you know whether you know the, the problems they've had with pasture so it's a real eye-opener for for what what else is going on in the industry and the problems that problems that guys are having and how they deal with those problems so and solutions so it's 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 great to to join those organizations and 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 meet people from your county that that you maybe wouldn't wouldn't meet outside of that because they're just they're just too far away so and then and and dad he's a, a director on the, the cattle feeders um hopefully we just got a little window up here that says we're maybe experiencing network connections hopefully everybody can still hear us and see us we can still hear and see. You can still hear us? Good, good. Okay. So yeah, Dad, he's been uh, on on that board of directors uh, for well since its inception. So he's he was part of uh, of I guess building that program and, and helping promote that program. So and that's another even another uh, aspect of you know with, through marketing and all that stuff that normally uh, maybe you wouldn't be exposed to you know you hear you hear the what goes on the program like at the convention they give you the update but there's more there's there's a lot more work going on behind the scenes to get to that point so it's he's he's been real uh a real pusher i guess behind that program moving it helping move it forward yeah we, we've taken we've Something, I mean, something I've been trying to teach the kids is, is take the opportunities that are in front of you. Don't pass on them because you're nervous or you're shy. So we've been approached a number of times. And I guess once we started saying yes, then people kept asking us to do different photo shoots and the opportunity to um, really let the public know that farmers aren't all chewing a piece of straw. Um, 
which is fine, but we do other things too. And we work off farm and we are extremely educated and all the rest of it. So we've um we've taken those opportunities. Um for me, um it's opened a lot of conversations. Uh, a lot of conversations with people that aren't from the farm industry that uh, that get a chance to ask or are really like all like all BFO's pictures are surprised that um that farmers look the way they do or don't look the way they think they do. So we've um we've been involved that way through through a couple different things. I was in the what was that farming the calendar the, the calendar with my sister who also married into farming. Um, and we've done stuff with then photos with um, Robert's farm equipment and with BFO. So really neat opportunities have come our way um, just from saying that. Being involved, and, yeah. yeah. Yeah, being open to that. I think that is great and very encouraging for sure for a lot of younger producers because it definitely can connect not only sectors like you said too, but uh, Jen also like you said about connecting with consumers, which is a great opportunity I think for many um so maybe we'll just wrap up with just kind of some final advice maybe that you guys would have for either new producers or young producers that are looking to get into the industry um you kind of touched on some of that as well by not saying no to opportunities that that come available um but any other advice that you'd have that could be some some words of encouragement uh for sometimes in the industry when things are uh, are not quite as encouraging for sure <laughs> yeah yeah uh it's at times like this it's it's really you know you try and remain upbeat and and i think honestly i think uh this coming year like in the in the short term here things will be good you know with the the, the pork thing in china you know meets the meets there's going to be a shorter a global shortage of meat so i think in the short term things will Hopefully, this is what I keep. This is what gets me out of bed in the morning. That this year will be a you know a really a really great year. Um, but yeah, advice you know just try and just sometimes it's hard, but you just do your best. Like I mean, some mornings you know when things are tough, maybe you just don't want to you don't want to feed those cattle. But you know I, we try to stick to a really you know a, kind of a rigid schedule you know with short time and you know. That helps with the performance and it overall makes a i think a better animal but just doing things like that where where it's maybe you feel like you're it's not worth the money to do it or you're maybe not going to get paid uh you know for that extra effort maybe you won't this time but if you keep doing that over and over again i mean get yourself a reputation for for having you know like like your animals are higher yielding or your animals are cleaner than the other ones they have less tag to do with any any like lots of little things that you can do just to help really uh your the next guy along in the in the chain you know if you're a cow calf guy like i said you know have do that extra vaccination to to make that next guy's uh, you know like a little bit easier it's only a few dollars for that uh but i feel like every time you help that person who's next in line from you that when it turns around they'll they'll help you back and, and and get paid back like that that two or three dollars on those vaccination you know you'll get paid 15 or 20 dollars extra for that calf because because I, I mean i'm willing to the health issues in that we see are that are expensive like i mean we give all the cows uh, like a draxon on arrival and there's still some that gets that, get, that you have to treat after that but i mean the 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 medicine that we have to put in these animals when they do get sick is expensive. So if you can do something to, to help me that they, they don't get sick or they, they perform a little bit better, then, then I know that I'm going to pass that back. I'm, I'm always willing to, to, to spend some of my profits and pass it on back down on the line. What do you have for advice? Great. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, the the year just a couple years after we got married was the year of BSC, and I don't think that as uh, like a consumer before that point that I realized that uh, there was risk involved with farming at all. So <laughs> it was a bit of a, a surprise, but um, 
Yeah, I mean, advice for farmers would be that as shocking as that was, that that we wrote it out, um, and that the the industry does balance. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I have if I have any advice to producers, but um, just quickly, there was a time where I worked at a bridal shop at a hand firm selling wedding dresses, and I worked in the wedding industry for a long time, and I would sometimes get a bride, a young bride into our salon that was telling you that they were marrying a dairy farmer or a farmer of some kind. Um, and I said, have you thought about it? And then they say, yeah, yeah. And I said, have you, have you really thought about it? <laughs> have, do you understand that it's a, a commitment to a different lifestyle? Do you understand that it's a seven day commitment? Um, it's never gonna be a five day commitment. It's gonna be a, a different commitment that's going to work out over the long haul, um, but you're gonna have seasons that that you become a harvest widow and it's gonna to be tough, but it's worth uh, worth sticking it out for the lifestyle in the long haul. Well, that's good. And then a very positive note then too from both of you. So that that is very good. Um, definitely the whole concept of of helping out the next person align and, and industry itself working together are, are some really good opportunities, I think, for our industry to continue to, to move forward for sure. Um, and hopefully, uh, for all you guys that were able to join us in tonight, um, you found some encouragement at least in that and, uh, and hopefully can take the advice that Scott and Jen have said about uh, not saying no to opportunities when they come up and, and taking advantage of, of some of the ways that you can get involved and, and further uh, your own involvement within the industry and, and your sector itself. So. Um, I would like to thank you both for taking the time tonight uh, to share about your operation and your industry and, and some of your input as well. Um, we certainly appreciate that. And uh, thank you to everyone who has joined in with us. And we will have the recorded version will be posted as well. Um, so anybody can feel free to, to look back or, or share this with anyone else that they think would be interested. So with that, thank you very much to everybody. And I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.